Okay, so this is the second lecture in the chapter um, that we're calling Er the first three years. Uh, it's going from ranging from chapter four into chapter six. So the last lecture we ended up and we were talking about cephalocaudal and cephalodorsal, those important terms, and breastfeeding. And in this lecture, I want to I want to talk about um, cognitive, well, I want to talk about brain development, the physiology of brain development, and then get into some of the conversation or some of the ideas about cognitive development, right? And you'll remember cognitive development refers to how people uh, learn to think. So this is an image of the synaptic uh, or synapses. And a couple important terms, hopefully you've taken psychology and some of this stuff should sound familiar but we're gonna be talking about them sort of throughout the rest of the semester. So I wanna introduce them or remind you of them again. So neuron refers to brain cells. You have them in your brain and your spinal cord, so your nervous system cells. Synapse refers to the space between the neur neurons, and that's where all of the chemicals, the neurotransmitters, that's where they all do their magic. Synaptic pruning is a really important word um, and what synaptic pruning refers to. So what you'll see here, this is an image of synaptic pruning, is that when babies are born, they have some synapses and then they, do, they grow more. They grow more of these neurons. And I, I'm sure somewhere in our textbook, it talks about how many hundreds of thousands of neurons we have. But right, actually, I listened to an interesting podcast the other day that suggests that we continue to have more neurons and more, more connections. And then around our teenage years, those neurons begin to prune. They begin to uh, what's referred to right here as lateralize, lateralization. And that simply means that they fire together. That in the beginning, um, in the beginning, we have all of these potential neurological connections, all of these potential synaptic connections. But part of what happens when we grow is the, the neurons, the connections that we use, the things that we uh, interact with, the images, if we use our ears or if we use our eyes or if we use our hands, those sensory paths begin to form. Um, they, they begin to form nucleus, but they fire together. And that's what, and, and that's sometimes is referred to as, that's referred to as lateralization, or if we're talking about memory, it's a memory trace, but the, it's kind of like muscle memory. Now, when you use the same muscles over and over again, they grow big and they grow strong. And when you don't use muscles, they atrophy or they deteriorate. And that's what's happening in our synapses, in our brain cells, is that the, the connections that we're using become stronger and the ones that don't wither away and die and that's referred to as pruning. So this, uh, this particular psychologist that I was listening to um, said that this continues, this continues up until adolescence and then that's why, that's why it's so easy for young people to learn new things and then around adolescence those become more specific and more fire, more, um, more of them die, right? So, and why we'll try new things, and we'll, we'll take on new skills and new interests, but as we get older, we're less able to do that because more of the, those unused synapses, we become, our brains have become specialized. So that's what um, lateralization and synaptic pruning. Um, so this, and, and many at this stage of early development, those pathways, those neurological pathways that are strengthening are auditory for our ears, right, your temporal lobes, and visual, our cortex for our, so if a child doesn't get to see, right, um, or if their eyes are not, are in such a, their, if their lenses don't allow for information and light to permeate the synapses that are connected to our eyes, won't get exercised and they'll die and they'll be pruned. So when we say things like, well, the person who can't see here has a stronger sense of hearing, um, this is how that happens because those neurons then get shifted to our ears if we're not using them in the eyes. Um, our, our bodies, our brains, our neurological system does not waste. And instead of, if, it's, if you're not gonna use it, we're gonna get rid of it. If we can use it someplace else, this is called plasticity. Oh, another really important word right there, plasticity. And plasticity refers to how our brain changes shape 
And one of the ways that changes shape is these neurological connections, these synapses, but also like it literally changes shape, structural, but functional means those functions that were over here in this brain, if you're not gonna use it, well, we're gonna, we're gonna take, we're gonna use this brain matter to do something else. Um, plasticity. Sensitive period is an important term and it refers to, I think we talked about that in the pre in one of the earlier chapters, but it refers to that there are certain times in a person's life that they're particularly receptive or they're particularly vulnerable or likely to learn something sensitive. Sometimes it's also called critical periods. Um, I believe the current thinking is, is that the sensitive is a better turn of phrase because critical lends the impression that if something doesn't happen, you'll never get it. Sensitive implies that these are times where you're really most likely to learn something. I can think of two. One of them is language and particularly a second language. So they tell us that if you have not learned a second language, but if you haven't learned a language by the time you're five years old, learn to speak it, you're always gonna have an accent. You'll always sound like a second language learner. And that's, but you can still learn languages later on, but you're not gonna sound like a native, uh, yeah, like a native speaker. You'll have like this funny kind of accent. So it's, it's sensitive because you're most receptive. Um, another one actually is riding bicycles. So like if you're, oh, 12, 15 years old and you still haven't learned a bicycle, how to ride one, you, you can still learn one, but you can still learn to do it. But you certainly would have been, it would have been easier for you to have learned it when you were younger, right? Because you would have been more sensitive to that development. Shaken baby syndrome, um, I don't think it's actually discussed in your textbook. Well, it is, it's discussed later on. But what shaken baby syndrome is, is it's literally, uh, it's, like a, it's like a brain bruise. So when a baby is shaken because the caregiver doesn't know what else to do with them or they're angry or whatever, that it can, it can cause all of this neurological tissue to like beat around the brain or the skull uh, or disconnect completely. It can basically like you can, I'm trying to think of a good example, but the same way you can shake a bag of chips and they all become crumbles, that can happen to the brain. And when we do that in these very early stages of life, we can impair the brain so that it, it never recovers, it never recovers. Okay, I hope that made some sense. Um, this slide, another, another group of terms here that are important to understand. I wanna, I wanna draw your attention to this point here that it says the baby's brain is about a quarter of the um, adult size brain. So that's like another textbook I used said that it was a third, said that the brain, the baby brain is a third. So somewhere around, it's a significant proportion. By the time you get to six, your brain is um, almost fully grown. And it's not that you don't get new brain cells, that's called neurogenesis. Uh, but you're probably not going to get much more surface area. Integration refers to all of your brain systems become more interconnected, right? So now we can pick something up, which is a motor sense, and we can process it, those integration. Differentiation is another way of talking, I was talking about localization. Localization means certain parts of the brain become specialized. Um, another word for that would be differentiation. Myelination, this is really important, myelin. Um, I think it's mentioned over here, yes, the coating of myelin. Myelin is actually a form of fat, and what happens in the neurons, and again, if you've taken psych, hopefully you've gotten this, but the neurons become covered with a fatty tissue so that the electrical charge can jump. But this is why it's really important that babies have enough fat in their diet and the right kind of fat, right? Mother's milk has a lot of fat in it, right? I mean, it's coming off of her hips. It's coming off of places she doesn't want it anymore. Um, and that's another reason that mother's milk is so good for the brain because, and if you see a picture of the brain, the white matter and the gray matter, the white matter is fat, right? Myelin, so you need fat to make myelin, myelin to cover the neurons so that that signal can move quickly. Some of the early senses, um, some of our early sensory experiences here, uh, we've, got, we've got some, what, the rooting reflex, oh, shoot, I think that's actually covered in another slide. But so we learn um, when a baby is born, they already have some ability to sense their environment. 
um, evidence that they can respond to touch. This rooting reflex is a phenomenon. I think it's another, I forget where it's at. It's a couple more slides down. Oh, it's down here. Um, but the rooting reflex is that if we, if when you brush something up the side of a baby's mouth, they'll open their mouth and they'll turn towards it, right? So you rub your breast on it so that that's sensitive to touch. They, at this point, prefer sweet things. Mother's milk is sweet. They recognize the sound of their mother's voice. And we, they've begun to develop the ability to see binocular, bi, binocularly um, by as early as five months. Um, so other, so one of the classic research projects that's, that they do on a child's perception, so their sense, so you have your sense, which is your physical ability to see things, but your perception is to understand what you're seeing. There's this classical study on depth perception. Um, this might show up on a quiz, this visual cliff experiment. And here's just an image of the visual cliff. I think they say as early, so the research tells us that by the time a child has developed, so here's an example of integration. By the time a child has learned to crawl, they have developed a sense of depth perception. In other words, the ability to perceive, well, ability to perceive depth, right? And the experiment is this one. And they set up this, uh, they set up this visual clip. So this is like plexiglass, right? And, and, it, and then this checkerboard pattern. So it looks like to the child, they perceive it as if they're gonna fall off the edge. But what the, what the research says is if a child can crawl, they won't crawl over it. They, they, and you can click on visual perception or visual clip experiments all over the internet, but they get to it and they stop or they attempt to climb down it even with the mother on the other side or the caregiver on the other side cheering them on babies will not go across the visual cliff right and this is used um is supporting evidence or considered to be supporting evidence um for the bill the child's ability to perceive depth right because if it looked the same of course it is the same it's plexiglass but if it looked the same they don't have a problem with crossing it and some animals um, are like this as well. Um, a couple other quick motor re or uh, reflex behavior that children are born with, and then I'll wrap this lecture up, um, some of what they call primitive. You have this one, which is the neck reflex. So I forget exactly what that one is. Um, the ones that I think are interesting is the step reflex. So when you put a baby down, this is like a brand new one, they will move their feet up and down as if they, as if they are trying to learn to walk but this is only happens in the early, like right after birth, and then eventually it goes away. So it's considered like we're born with this tendency or this reflex to move our legs. So we already have the skills to walk, but at this point we don't have the strength. Uh, this one I believe is that if you put a baby on their tummy, um, how neurologically typical babies will move their feet and move their arms as if they're trying to crawl. Um, another one refers to they're putting something in their hand that they will by instinctively close their hand. And these are, are motor activities that we appear to be born with. I'm trying to think of some of the others. There's another one that if you move them real quickly on their back, they'll sort of flail like this, like they're trying to keep them, like they're trying to hold themselves up. Um, and that's what this little video is. I'll link this one up in case anybody happens to be interested. And I think I'm going to stop right now when we come back. Oh, fiddle sticks. Um, when we, well, let me talk about that one right now. Um, this one is simply, I don't think that's the what's used in your textbook. Your textbook, oh, here we go. Some of the other reflexes. Sucking reflex, um, Mora reflex. That's the one where you drop the baby and they all, uh, they try to, they try to like catch themselves. They all have some funky names. And so like, if you're a, a baby nurse, these might be some of the things that you do with your baby with them in order to measure or to assess the child's neurological development. Um, touch, head control. We learned to control our head before, and that's what this is about. So this is about the typical path of motor development. One, I was looking for what they called it in your textbook. Um, one theory is referred to as the dynamic systems theory. 
and this one makes sense to me. The dynamic systems theory is, I think the other one is called the ecological, there it is right there, page two, 122, it refers to your dynamic systems theory. Um, but the idea is that motor development is a dynamic process, so it's an ongoing process. And children develop their biological, their neurological systems to become mobile, um, are developed in concert with the environmental demands, right? So a fancy, it's another way of saying or the language that we would use to explain why a child with siblings walks faster than a child who doesn't have siblings, right? Because they're trying to keep up with their siblings. But what you see here is that as a child's motors, as their muscles, and as their muscles become, um, as, as their brain allows them to control their motor environment, that then they will use, or their motor, um, their ability to move their arms and their legs, they will use the environment to um, promote or to facilitate their locomotion. Uh, in other words, so a kid learns to crawl, right? And then after they learn to crawl, they're gonna crawl over to the table and they're gonna use a table to pull them up. And then once they pull themselves up, they see a toy on the other side of the room. And so it's the table and the environment that helps them pull themselves up. Well, now they've mastered that. Well, now there's something over there they want. So there's something in the environment that's motivating them to master another skill and another skill. So this is, you know, one of the problems when you got toddlers and they're learning to crawl and they're gonna climb out of everything because they're using the things built in the environment. It's a system and it's a system that changes. So it's a dynamic system that changes and it promotes their motor development, right? I hope that makes some sense. So they get steps, they get to the steps. Well, they've gotta learn a new skill because they've got these steps that they can climb, right? Or they get to something else and they learn another skill. So this is also explains um, this phenomena here, and I actually think this is a quiz. I think I asked you about this in a discussion question, is what does culture have to do with our children's ability to walk or to crawl or the, or the path with which they learn to walk or crawl? And the answer to that is if a culture, in a culture where babies are carried all the time or in their babushka all the time, they don't have the opportunity to interact in the environment to learn to crawl. If, on the other hand, our culture puts our children, and I think, I don't like, I think it was in your textbook where, yeah, probably so, um, in your textbook where they talk about how in some cultures, while women are working in the field, they dig a little hole right? And they put their kid in the hole, like not, a, not in the ground, but, you know, instead of like a playpen, you would put them and the child then has opportunity to climb around, to crawl around. Babies that are put on the floor more will probably learn to crawl faster than babies that are never put on the floor. Because from this theory, it's the environment that motivates them um, or creates opportunities for them to learn to crawl. So in cultures where they, the babies are in the babushkas all the time, they don't walk as soon. But here's another thing, the pattern, and I think that's on here, there it is, the pattern is the same. World over, children learn in a similar sequence of events. Now they may skip some, like my kid never crawled. She, well, she did, I guess, briefly, and then the next thing we knew she was, you know, walking. And in some cases, babies may actually run before they can walk slow. Well, this has to do with balance, right? It's easier to maintain your balance than it is to walk very slowly. It's like riding a bicycle. There's a certain pace where it's really hard to keep your balance if you're riding your bicycle slow. So that's what this one says, is that the culture influences the pace at which we learn some of these motor skills. I am gonna stop now, and when we come back, we will talk about some of the cognitive, some of the other cognitive developments and some of the theories behind those cognitive developments of babies.